The following is the short story At Twilight by Susan Glassbell. Narrated by Kimberly Schraff. A breeze from the May world without blew through the classroom, and as it lifted his papers, he had a curious sense of freshness and mustiness meeting. He looked at the group of students before him, half smiling at the way the breath of spring was teasing the hair of the girls sitting by the window. Anna Lawrence was trying to pin hers back again, but May would have none of such decorum, and only waited long enough for her to finish her work before joyously undoing it. She caught the laughing, admiring eyes of a boy sitting across from her and sought to conceal her pleasure in her unmanageable wealth of hair by a wry little face, and then the eyes of both strayed out to the trees that had scented that breeze for them, looking with frank longing at the campus which stretched before them in all its May glory that sunny afternoon. He remembered having met this boy and girl strolling in the twilight the evening before, and as a buoyant breeze that instant swept his own face, he had a sudden, irrelevant consciousness of being seventy-three years old. Other eyes were straying to the trees and birds and lilacs of that world, from which the classroom was for the hour shutting them out. He was used to it, that straying of young eyes in the spring. For more than forty years he had sat at that desk and talked to young men and women about philosophy, and in those forty years there had always been straying eyes in May. The children of some of those boys and girls had in time come to him, and now there were other children who, before many years went by, might be sitting upon those benches, listening to lectures upon what men had thought about life while their eyes strayed out where life called. So it went on, May, perhaps, the philosopher triumphant. As, with a considerable effort, for the languor of spring or some other languor was upon him too, he brought himself back to the papers they had handed in, he found himself thinking of those first boys and girls, now men and women, and parents of other boys and girls, He hoped that philosophy had, after all, done something more than shut them out from May. He had always tried not so much to instruct them in what men had thought as to teach them to think, and perhaps now, when May had become a time for them to watch the straying of other eyes, they were the less desolate because of the habits he had helped them to form. He wanted to think that he had done something more than hold them prisoners. There was a sadness today in his sympathy. He was tired. It was hard to go back to what he had been saying about the different things the world's philosophers had believed about the immortality of the soul. So, as often when his feeling for his thought dragged, he turned to Greta Loring. She seldom failed to bring a revival of interest, a freshening. She was his favorite student. He did not believe that in all the years there had been any student who had not only pleased, but helped him as she did. He had taught her father and mother, and now there was Greta, clear-eyed and steady of gaze, asking more of life than either of them had asked, asking not only May, but what May meant. For Greta there need be no duality. She was one of those rare ones for whom the meaning of life opened new springs to the joy of life, for whom life intensified with the understanding of it. He never said a thing that gratified him as reaching toward the things not easy to say, but that he would find Greta's face illumined, and always that eager little leaning ahead for more. She had that look of waiting now, but today it seemed less an expectant than a troubled look. She wanted him to go on with what he had been saying about the immortality of the soul. But it was not so much a demand upon him. He had come to rely upon those demands as it was. He had an odd, altogether absurd sense of its being a fear for him. She looked uncomfortable, fretted, 
and suddenly he was startled to see her searching eyes blurred by something that must be tears. She turned away, and for just a minute it seemed to leave him alone and helpless. He rubbed his forehead with his hand. It felt hot. It got that way sometimes lately when he was tired, and the close of that hour often found him tired. He believed he knew what she wanted. She would have him declare his own belief. In the youthful flush of her modernism, she was impatient with that fumbling around with what other men had thought. Despising the muddled thinking of some of her classmates, she would have him put it right to them with, as for yourself. He tried to formulate what he would care to say. But perhaps just because he was too tired to say it right, the life the robin in the nearest tree was that moment celebrating in song seemed more important than anything he had to say about his own feeling toward the things men had thought about the human soul. It was ten minutes before closing time, but suddenly he turned to his class with, Go out of doors and think about it. This is no day to sit within and talk of philosophy. What men have thought about life in the past is less important than what you feel about it today. He paused, then added, he could not have said why, and don't let the shadow of either belief or unbelief fall across the days that are here for you now. Again he stopped, then surprised himself by ending, philosophy should quicken life, not deaden it. They were not slow in their going. Their astonishment in his wanting them to go quickly engulfed in their pleasure in doing so. It was only Greta who lingered a moment, seeming too held by his manner in sending her out into the sunshine to care about going there. He thought she was going to come to the desk and speak to him. He was sure she wanted to, but at the last she went hastily, and he thought, just before she turned her face away, that it was a tear he saw on her lashes. Strange. Was she unhappy, she through whom life surged so richly? And yet was it not true that where it gave much, it exacted much? Feeling much and understanding what she felt and feeling for what she understood— must she also suffer much? Must one always pay? He sighed and began gathering together his papers. Thoughts about life tired him today. On the steps he paused, unreasonably enough a little saddened as he watched some of them beginning a tennis game. Certainly they were losing no time, eager to let go thoughts about life for its pleasures. Very few of them awake to that rich life he had tried to make them ready for. He drooped still more wearily at the thought that perhaps the most real gift he had for them was that unexpected ten minutes. Remembering a book he must have from the library, he turned back. He went to the alcove where the works on philosophy were to be found and was reaching up for the volume he wanted when a sentence from a lowly murmured conversation in the next aisle came to him across the stack of books. That's all very well. We know, of course, that he doesn't believe. But what will he do when it comes to himself? It arrested him, coming as it did from one of the girls who had just left his classroom. He stood there motionless, his hand still reaching up for the book. Do? Why, face it, of course. Face it as squarely as he's faced every other fact of life. That was Greta, and though mindful of the library mandate for silence, her tone was low. It was vibrant with a fine scorn. Well, said the first speaker, I guess he'll have to face it before very long. That was not answered. There was a movement on the other side of the barricade of books. It might have been that Greta had turned away. His hand dropped down from the high shelf. He was leaning against the books. Haven't you noticed, Greta, how he's losing his grip? 
At that, his head went up sharply. He stood altogether tense as he waited for Greta to set the other girl right. Greta, so sure-seeing, so much wiser and truer than the rest of them, Greta would laugh. But she did not laugh. And what his strained ear caught at last was not her scornful denial, but a little gasp of breath suggesting a sob. Noticed it? Why, it breaks my heart. He stared at the books through which her low, passionate voice had carried. Then he sank to the chair that fortunately was beside him. Power for standing had gone from him. Father says, a father's on the board, you know, it was the first girl who spoke, that they don't know what to do about it. It's not justice to the school to let him begin another year. These things are arranged with less embarrassment in the big schools, where a man begins emeritus at a certain time, though of course they'll pension him. He's done a lot for the school. He thanked Greta for her little laugh of disdain. The memory of it was more comforting, more satisfying, than any attempt to put it into words could have been. He heard them move away, their skirts brushing the bookstacks in passing. A little later, he saw them out in the sunshine on the campus. Greta joined one of the boys for a game of tennis. Motionless, he sat looking out at her. She looked so very young as she played. For an hour, he remained at the table in the alcove where he had overheard what his students had to say of him. And when the hour had gone by, he took up the pen, which was there upon the study table, and wrote his resignation to the secretary of the board of trustees. It was very brief, simply that he felt the time had come when a younger man could do more for the school than he, and that he should like his resignation to take effect at the close of the present school year. He had an envelope and sealed and stamped the letter, ready to drop in the box in front of the building as he left. He had always served the school as best he could. He lost no time now, once convinced, in rendering to it the last service he could offer it, that of making way for the younger man. Looking things squarely in the face, and it was the habit of a lifetime to look things squarely in the face, he had not been long in seeing that they were right. Things tired him now as they had not once tired him. He had less zest at the beginning of the hour, more relief at the close of it. He seemed stupid in not having seen it for himself, but possibly many people were a little stupid in seeing that their own time was over. Of course he had thought, in a vague way, that his working time couldn't be much longer, but it seemed part of the way human beings managed with themselves that things in even the very near future kept the remoteness of future things. Now he understood Greta's troubled look and her tears. He knew how those fine nerves of hers must have suffered, how her own mind had wanted to leap to the aid of his, how her own strength must have tormented her in not being able to reach his flagging powers. It seemed part of the whole hardness of life that she who would care the most would be the one to see it most understandingly. What he was trying to do was to see it all very simply, in matter-of-fact fashion, that there might be no bitterness and the least of tragedy. It was nothing unique in human history he was facing. One did one's work, then when through, one stopped. He tried to feel that it was as simple as it sounded, but he wondered if back of many of those brief letters of resignation that came at quitting time, there was the hurt, the desolation, that there was no use denying to himself was back of his. He hoped that most men had more to turn to. Most men of seventy-three had grandchildren. That would help, surrounding one with a feeling of the naturalness of it all. But that school had been his only child, and he had loved it with the tenderness one gives a child. That in him which would have gone to the child had gone to the school. 
The woman whom he loved had not loved him. He had never married. His life had been called lonely, but lonely though it undeniably had been, the life he won from books and work and thinking had kept the chill from his heart. He had the gift of drawing life from all contact with life. Working with youth, he kept that feeling for youth that does for the life within what sunshine and fresh air do for the room in which one dwells. It was now that the loneliness that blights seemed waiting for him. Life used one, and that in the ugly, not the noble sense of being used. Stripped of the fine fancies men wove around it, what was it beyond just a matter of being sucked dry and then thrown aside? Why not admit that and then face it? And the abundance with which one might have given, the joy in the giving, had no bearing upon the fact that it came at last to that question of getting one out of the way. It was no one's unkindness. It was just that life was like that. Indeed, the bitterness festered around the thought that it was life itself, the way of life, not the brutality of any particular people. They'll pension him. He's done a lot for the school. Even the grateful memory of Greta's tremulous, scoffing little laugh for the way it fell short could not follow to the deep place that had been hurt. Getting himself in hand again, and trying to face this as simply and honestly as he had sought to face the other, he knew that it was true he had done a great deal for the school. He did not believe it too much to say he had done more for it than any other man. Certainly more than any other man he had given it what place it had with men who thought. He had come to it in his early manhood, and at a time when the school was in its infancy— just a crude, struggling little western college. Greta Loring's grandfather had been one of its founders, founding it in revolt against the cramping sectarianism of another college. He had gloried in the spirit which gave it birth, and it was he who, through the encroachings of problems of administration and the ensnarements and entanglements of practicality, had fought to keep unattached and unfettered that spirit of freedom in the service of truth. His own voice had been heard and recognized, and a number of times during the years calls had come from more important institutions, but he had not cared to go. For year by year there deepened that personal love for the little college to which he had given the youthful ardor of his own intellectual passion. All his life's habits were one with it, his days seemed beaten into the path that cut across the campus. The vines that season after season went a little higher on the wall out there indicated his strivings by their own, and the generation that had worn down even the stones of those front steps had furrowed his forehead and stooped his shoulders. He had grown old along with it. His days were twined around it, it was the place of his efforts and satisfactions, joys, perhaps, he should not call them, of his falterings and his hopes. He loved it because he had given himself to it, loved it because he had helped to bring it up. On the shelves all around him were the books which it had been his pleasure, because during some of those hard years they were to be had in no other way— to order himself and pay for from his own almost ludicrously meager salary. He remembered the excitement there always was in getting them fresh from the publisher and bringing them over there in his arms, the satisfaction in coming in next day and finding them on the shelves. Such had been his dissipations, his indulgences of self. Many things came back to him as he sat there, going back over busy years, the works on philosophy looking down upon him, the shadows of that spring afternoon gathering around him. He looked like a very old man indeed, as he at last reached out for the letter he had written to the trustees, relieving them of their embarrassment. Twilight had come on. On the front steps, 
he paused and looked around the campus. It was growing dark in that lingering way it has in the spring, daylight creeping away under protest, night coming gently, as if it knew that the world, having been so pleasant, day would be loath to go. The boys and girls were going back and forth upon the campus and the streets. They could not bear to go within. For more than forty years it had been like that. It would be like that for many times forty years, indeed until the end of the world, for it would be the end of the world when it was not like that. He was glad that they were out in the twilight, not indoors trying to gain from books something of the meaning of life. That course had its satisfactions along the way, but it was surely no port of peace to which it bore one at the last. He shrunk from going home. There were so many readjustments he must make once home. So, lingering, he saw that off among the trees, a girl was sitting alone. She threw back her head in a certain way just then, and he knew by the gesture that it was Greta Loring. He wondered what she was thinking about. What did one who thought think about over there on the other side of life? Youth and age looked at life from opposite sides. Then they could not see it alike, for what one saw in life seemed to depend so entirely upon how the light was falling from where one stood. He could not have said just what it was made him cross the campus toward her. Part of it was the desire for human sympathy, one thing, at least, which age did not deaden. But that was not the whole of it, nor the deepest thing in it. It was an urge of the spirit to find and keep for itself a place where the light was falling backward upon life. She was quiet in her greeting, and gentle. Her cheeks were still flushed, her hair tumbled from her game, but her eyes were thoughtful, and he thought, sad. He felt that the sadness was because of him, of him and the things of which he made her think. He knew of her affection for him, the warmth there was in her admiration of the things for which he had fought. He had discovered that it hurt her now that others should be seeing, and not he. Pained her to watch so sorry a thing as his falling below himself, wounded both pride and heart, that men whom she would doubtless say had never appreciated him were whispering among themselves about how to get rid of him. Why, the poor child might even be tormenting herself with the idea she ought to tell him. That was why he told her. He pointed to the address on the envelope, saying, That carries my resignation, Greta. Her start and the tears which rushed to her eyes told him he was right about her feeling. She did not seem able to say anything. Her chin was trembling. I see that the time has come, he said, when a younger man can do more for the school than I can hope to do for it. Still, she said nothing at all. But her eyes were deepening, and she had that very steadfast, almost inspired look that had so many times quickened him in the classroom. She was not going to deny it. She was not going to pretend. After the first feeling of having got something needed, he rose to her high ground, ground she had taken it for granted he would take. And will you believe it, Greta, he said, rising to that ground and there asking, not for the sympathy that bends down, but for a hand in passing. There comes a hard hour when first one feels the time has come to step aside and be replaced by that younger man. She nodded. It must be, she said simply, it must be very much harder than any of us can know till we come to it. She brought him a sense of his advantage in experience, his riches, to be sure, there was that. And he was oddly comforted by the honesty in her, which could not stoop to dishonest comforting. In what superficially might seem her failure, there was a very real victory for them both. 
and there was nothing of coldness in her reserve. There was the fullness of understanding and of valuing the moments too highly for anything there was to be said about it. There was a great spiritual dignity, a nobility, in the way she was looking at him. It called upon the whole of his own spiritual dignity. It was her old demand upon him, but this time the tears through which her eyes shone were tears of pride in fulfillment, not of sorrowing for failure. Suddenly he felt that his life had not been spent in vain, that the lives of all those men of his day who had fought the good fight for intellectual honesty, spiritual dignity, had not been spent in vain if they were leaving upon the earth even a few who were like the girl beside them. It turned him from himself to her. She was what counted, for she was what remained, and he remained in just the measure that he remained through her, counted in so far as he counted for her. It was as if he had been facing in the wrong direction, and now a kindly hand had turned him around. It was not in looking back there he would find himself. He was not back there to be found. Only so much of him lived as had been able to wing itself ahead, on in the direction she was moving. It did not particularly surprise him that when she at last spoke, it was to voice a shade of that same feeling. I was thinking she began, of that younger man, of what he must mean to the man who gives way to him. She was feeling her way as she went, groping among the many dim things that were there. He had always liked to watch her face when she was thinking her way step by step. I think you used a word wrongly a minute ago, she said with a smile. You spoke of being replaced. But that isn't it. A man like you isn't replaced. He's... She got it right after a minute and came forth with it triumphantly. Fulfilled. Her face was shining as she turned to him after that. Don't you see? He's there waiting to take your place. Because you got him ready. Why, you made that younger man. Your whole life has been a getting ready for him. He can do his work because you first did yours. Of course he can go farther than you can. Wouldn't it be a sorry commentary on you if he couldn't? Her voice throbbed warmly upon that last, and during the pause, the light it had brought still played upon her face. We were talking in class about immortality, she went on more slowly. There's one form of immortality I like to think about. It's that all those who from the very first have given anything to the world are living in the world today. There was a rush of tears to her eyes and of affection to her voice as she finished very low. You'll never die. You've deepened the consciousness of life too much for that. They sat there as twilight drew near to night, the old man and the young girl, silent. The laughter of boys and girls and the good night calls of the birds were all around them. The fragrance of life was around them. It was one of those silences to which come impressions, faiths, longings, not yet born as thoughts. Something in the quality of that silence brought the rescuing sense of its having been good to have lived and done one's part. That sense which, from places of desolation and over ways rough and steep and dark, can find its way to the meadows of serenity. This is Kimberly Schraff for ListenToGenius.com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audiobooks. Permission is granted to download for personal use only, not for distribution or commercial use. 
The following is the short story, The Eternal Feminine, by Temple Bailey, narrated by Vanessa Hart. If it had been anyone but Anne Beaumont. I don't like turning conventionalities topsy-turvy, Sophie, she said as we went downstairs. I don't believe I can ever ask a man to dance with me. Other women do, I murmured. My husband would never have agreed to such a thing, Anne stated. That is where Anne always had the advantage of me. Although she had been a widow for five years, she still quoted the authoritative masculine point of view, while I, having in my teens chosen a career instead of a husband, and never having rectified my mistake, was forced to fall back on the unsupported feminine. Perhaps she'd rather sit out the dances, was my somewhat malicious way of putting it. Anne, poised like a white butterfly on the landing, turned on me a reproachful glance. "'No woman would rather be a wallflower,' she affirmed. "'Of course not,' I returned promptly. "'And I don't believe it is going to be very bad after the first plunge.' Anne leaned over the stair rail and surveyed the formidable group of men in the lower hall. "'It's dreadful,' she said. Then gathering about her a scarf of silver tissue, she commanded— "'You go first, Sophie,' and we descended together. "'At the foot of the stairs, Charlemagne Dabney met us. "'Charlie boy,' Anne said plaintively, "'ask me to dance with you. "'I simply can't get used to the leap year idea.' "'And I, having prepared to blunder into a formal "'May I have the pleasure,' "'was so illumined by her method "'that I employed it with success. "'For though I lacked Anne's appealing coquetry, I challenged old friends, and my card was soon filled. But Anne did not depend on old friends. She danced with the Count from Hungary, the multimillionaire from the West, the Senator from Kentucky, and to fill up spaces, she fell back on Charlemagne Dabney. I think it was lovely of you, she told him at supper, to open the house for the weekend and the dance. Only it's too bad that you insist on the leap year idea for the whole time. Across the table, Elizabeth Ames sparkled radiantly. I like it. I didn't dance with a single bore, and before I go home, I'm going to ask all of the men to marry me. Anne's face wore its most gracious expression, but I knew how she felt. Elizabeth is eighteen and pretty. Anne is twice eighteen and pretty, and there's a difference. Anne opened her eyes very wide and said to Charlemagne, "'You see what you've done. Elizabeth is going to ask you to marry her.' Charlemagne smiled at Elizabeth. "'No such good luck. There are too many young fellows who will accept her before she gives me the chance.' Elizabeth laughed back. "'Don't be too sure that you'll escape.' Anne's delicate eyebrows were raised. "'Of course she is joking. No woman would really ask a man.' Charlemagne sighed. "'I wish one woman would.' Anne's lashes fluttered. "'Why don't you ask her?' she challenged. "'He shrugged his shoulders. "'I feel weak in the knees when I think of it,' he said, "'for fear she might say no. "'Faint heart,' I murmured, "'but no one paid any attention to me. "'It seemed to me, after that, "'as if some of the brightness had gone out of Elizabeth's face. "'But Anne fairly scintillated, "'and she was exceedingly amiable to Elizabeth. "'Ask the Count first, I heard her say. "'He's simply charming.' Elizabeth flung up her head in a quick way. She was all in sheer pale yellow, bordered with daffodils, and there was a twist of gold ribbon in her fair hair. Only extreme youth could have worn it, and as she flashed her answer back to Anne, I had never seen her more beautiful. The Count wouldn't have me as a precious gift, she said. I'm too crude. He likes a more finished product, like you, dear Mrs. Beaumont. "'Now what do you suppose she meant by that?' said Anne that night, when we were in our kimonos and were comforting our complexions with cold cream. "'Do you think she meant it for a compliment? Or was it a reflection on my age?' "'No one can reflect on your age,' I told her. "'Nobody knows it but Charlemagne and me, and we won't tell. "'That's the advantage of living on the other side and coming back to meet the younger generation,' said Anne. "'They haven't kept tabs on the years.' She got up and moved restlessly around the room. With the cream on her face and with her hair down, she looked old. 
and I had a vision of Elizabeth in the yellow gown. Perhaps something of my thought showed, for Anne stopped suddenly and gazed into a long mirror set in the door. Oh, youth, youth, Sophie, she cried. Anne, I said, come away from that mirror. No one can be beautiful with her face full of cold cream. She laughed and dropped down on the rug in front of me. And after a while, she said, Did you hear what he said tonight? About wishing a certain woman would ask him? Yes. He will never ask me, Sophie. He thinks I'm still mourning my husband. He thinks I don't care. There wasn't much to be said after that. But before I left her, I whispered, Why don't you tell him, Anne? Anne's shocked eyes condemned me. Oh, Sophie, as if a woman could. I passed Elizabeth Ames' room on my way to my own, and she called to me. Come in, Miss Sophie. It's so late, I protested, standing on the threshold. But she was insistent. Please come, she begged. You ought to be in bed, I scolded, getting your beauty sleep. But even as I said it, I knew she didn't need it, for she was as daintily fresh as a rose. Her fair hair hung down in two heavy braids over her white gown. She looked like a lovely child. Miss Sophie, she said abruptly, when she had put me into a big chair in front of the fire. Tell me about Anne Beaumont and Mr. Dabney. What about them? I asked innocently. Were they in love with each other? Years ago, before she married Mr. Beaumont? I nodded. They were engaged, and Anne was very young. She had never seen much of other men, and when Mr. Beaumont came along with his air of foreign distinction, she was fascinated and broke off her engagement. But she never really cared for Mr. Beaumont. And you think Mr. Dabney has... Has stayed single for her sake? I think so, yes. And you think he loves her still? You heard what he said tonight? I don't call that love, she cried. If he cared, he'd tell her. He couldn't help it. It would just come if he really loved her. He thinks that she has never cared. And he isn't an impetuous boy. I know, but he's a man. She was all aglow. And if he cared, his heart would say, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then his lips would say it. You believe, then, that he doesn't care for her? His allegiance is a memory, an old dream of the girl she was, not of the woman she is. Isn't she older than he, Miss Sophie? She is younger, I said gravely. She seems older, and... It's spoiling his life. He, he won't look at another woman, because in a way he feels bound to her. Someday I'm going to tell him. I stared at her. Tell him what, Elizabeth? That he is throwing away his happiness. That there are other women. She had risen and stood in front of me with her hand on her heart. Her eyes were like stars, and the radiance of youth shone from within and round about her. If Charlemagne should see her in such a mood, I thought of Anne, dear Anne. Elizabeth, I said sharply, if you should tell him that, he would think that you cared. She swept out her arms in a charming gesture of surrender. Well, if he did, she cried defiantly, what then? All that night, Elizabeth and Anne contended in my dreams, and in the morning, worn to a frazzle, I went down to breakfast to find that Elizabeth had gone for a ride with Charlemagne and that Anne was still in bed. I drifted into the library and found there a circle of somewhat fagged-out feminines. The men were riding or on the links. From the light bits of conversation that were wafted to me as I sat and read in the window seat, I gathered that most of the women took Charlemagne's leap year idea as a joke, but I knew that to Elizabeth and Anne the question presented itself seriously, and that each would settle it in her own way and according to the tradition of her time. For that education and environment had made the difference, I did not doubt. Had Elizabeth been born eighteen years earlier, when women were taught the mysteries of advance and retreat, 
that coquetry was their best weapon, and that man must always be the wooer. She might have felt all of Anne's shrinking from a revelation of herself, whereas had Anne been brought up in the later days, when boys and girls mingle in close comradeship, when plays and books subtly analyze the state of woman as the pursuer and man as the pursued. She might have been as frank about her feelings as Elizabeth. Hence, I argued, they were both of them what their generation had made them, and I, who loved Anne, and adored her for her womanliness, was yet forced to admit the potency of Elizabeth's youth and the charm of her complete surrender. After a time, the men began to drift in, and I heard the multimillionaire from the West inquiring for Elizabeth. He was a big, broad-shouldered fellow, sure of himself, but not unpleasantly so. And when he couldn't find the girl he wanted, he came over and talked to me. Say, he began at once, it's all Tommy right about this leap year business. When I want a girl to do anything, I want to ask her. It makes me feel foolish to have to wait for her to come to me. I wish Dabney would cut it out. But think what an opportunity for a girl to get what she wants, I said. They don't know what they want, he stated dogmatically. The way to win a woman is to pick her up and put her on a horse and run away with her. Suppose she doesn't care to be run away with, I asked. Oh, she'd settle down to it, he said securely. And besides that, I can't really imagine a nice girl asking a man to marry her. I thought of Elizabeth as she had stood with her hand on her heart and had hurled defiance at conventions. Girls are hard to understand, I murmured. Oh, I don't know, he contended. If a man gets right down to primitive principles and keeps after her, he'll get her. And it makes me hot to think I am wasting valuable time trying to stick to Dabney's old rules when I have to go back west again on Monday. I wanted to be sure, so I murmured. Of course, it's Elizabeth Ames. Who else? He demanded. Oh, I'm going to jump over the traces, Miss Sophie, and let her know I mean business. This thing of sitting around and letting her go off with another man, you know she's riding with Dabney this morning. I nodded. He's twice her age, and she thinks she likes him. Girls get romantic streaks, and Dabney's the kind they put up on a pedestal. But he isn't any more suited to her than a bunch of beets. I suppose not, was all the response I dared venture in the face of such an outpouring of eloquence. They are coming now, he said, and through the window I saw them. Elizabeth, looking like a little girl in her three-cornered hat, with her hair tied with a broad black ribbon, and Charlemagne sitting his horse like a centaur. The westerner deserted me at once, and, the rest of the guests following, I was left alone in the library. I curled up in the window seat drew the curtains to shield me from the gaze of those who might step within, and tried to take forty winks to make up for the four hundred I had missed the night before. But I couldn't sleep. Elizabeth and Anne, Anne and Elizabeth. I couldn't get their affairs out of my mind. Would Elizabeth propose? Would Anne? Would Charlemagne? Would the multimillionaire? Again and again I tried to fit together their widely different theories. <sighs> until in despair. I wish that Charlemagne in his leap year weekend had not tempted me from my maidenly apartment in town, where the worries of lovers were confined to my manuscripts. And even as I pondered, I heard Elizabeth's voice saying, as she came in from the porch, I suppose you think I am awfully forward to make you spend all your morning with me. As he followed her into the library, Charlemagne laughed. I might feel flattered, he said, if I didn't know you were doing it to make McChesney furious. McChesney was the multimillionaire. McChesney? Elizabeth's tone was startled. Don't hedge, Charlemagne teased. He's bound to win out, Elizabeth. No woman can escape a man when he goes for her like that. You might as well give in. I shall never give in. He's a nice fellow. He's not my ideal. There was a pathetic note of appeal in her young voice. Ah, ideals. Charlemagne had dropped his banter. Don't spoil your happiness looking for the ideal man. He's like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, something we hear of but have never seen. 
There was a heavy silence. Then Elizabeth said, catching her breath, "But, but I have found my ideal, Mister Dabney. You have, and it's not McChesney." I peeped at them through the curtain. They were in big wicker chairs in front of the door that led to the porch. Elizabeth had taken off her coat, showing her thin white blouse with its crisp frills. Her cheeks were as pink as the rose which she picked to pieces with nervous fingers. No, she said tremulously, "It's, it's not, Mister McChesney." I held my breath. Would she dare? It's, it's a man much older than I am. She went on, and, and I don't know that he has ever thought of me, in that way. Perhaps if he had, he might like me, a little. I am sure that Charlemagne felt the charm of her youth, as she made her little confession, and I am just as sure that he was absolutely innocent that he was the object of it. He would undoubtedly love you more than a little, he said heartily. Look here, Elizabeth, you won't mind telling me who he is. Will you? Here was an opportunity holding out open arms, and did Elizabeth embrace it as beseemed an advocate of woman's right to woo? Not she. She simply gasped in a panic-stricken way and stood up. Oh no! She whispered with her cheeks flaming. I couldn't. I couldn't tell anyone. Before Charlemagne could answer, McChesney blundered in. Say. He stopped dead still on the threshold. I think this is a case of monopoly. I'm tired of hanging around waiting for the girl I want. I'm going to break the rules, Dabney, and ask Miss Ames to take me for a walk in the rose garden. And Elizabeth actually turned to him with an air of relief. Oh yes, she said breathlessly. I'd love it. And away they went. And Charlemagne, turning back into the library, met Anne Beaumont coming in at the other door. She wore a thin, trailing white gown, and there were dark shadows under her eyes. She looked tired and fragile, and every day of her thirty-six years. Anne, Charlemagne said, as if for him all the morning stars sang together. Anne dropped into the chair where Elizabeth had been. I'm afraid I'm awfully late getting down," she faltered. "But, but my head ached." Charlemagne stood behind her chair, and there was a look on his face that, for the first time, made me ashamed of my eavesdropping. The other had been comedy, but this was real. "Poor little Anne," he said. Anne propped her chin on her hand and gazed out through the open door with wide eyes. "Yes." She said slowly, "Poor little Anne." He came around and took the other chair. "I wish I knew how I might comfort you," he said. For a moment, Anne looked at him with that wide stare. Then, like a flash, it came. "Oh, Charlie, Charlie boy!" she cried. "Why don't you ask me to marry you? I can't ask you, you know." Before she had finished, he was on his knees beside her, and then I shut my eyes and put my fingers in my ears, for the time had come when I had no right to hear or see. But as for theories, ah,、oh, who knows what a woman will do? There was Elizabeth, and there was Anne, but I never would have believed it of Anne. This is Vanessa Hart for ListenToGenius dot com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audio Books. Permission is granted to download for personal use only, not for distribution or commercial use. Not she. She simply gasped. The following is the short story the "The Eternal、up. Feminine" by Temple Bailey. The following、Not、is the、she. short story she "The Eternal Feminine" by Temple Bailey. The following、up. is the short story "The Eternal Feminine" by Listen to Temple Bailey. Presented by Listen to Temple Bailey. Still on the threshold. Narrated by Vanessa Hart.
Bailey. 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 The following is the short story, The Eternal Feminine, by Temple Bailey. He came around and took the other chair. I wish... I knew how I might comfort you, he said. For a moment, Anne looked at him with that wide stare. Then, like a flash, it came. Oh, Charlie, Charlie boy. <clears throat> For a moment, Anne looked at him with that wide stare. Then, like a flash, it came. Oh, Charlie, Charlie boy, she cried. Why don't you ask me to marry you? I can't ask you, you know. Before she had finished, he was on his knees beside her, and then I shut my eyes and put my fingers in my ears. For the time had come when I had no right to hear or see. But as for theories, but as for theories, oh, who knows what a woman will do? There was Elizabeth, there was Elizabeth, and there was Anne. But I never would have believed it of Anne. This is Vanessa Hart for ListenToGenius.com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audio Books. Permission is granted to download for personal use only not for distribution or commercial use. The following is the short story, His Mother's Portrait, by Selma Lagerlof, narrated by Maggie Meg Reed. In one of the hundred houses of the fishing village, where each is exactly like the other in size and shape, where all have just as many windows and as high chimneys, lived old Matson, the pilot, in all the rooms of the fishing village there is the same sort of furniture. On all the window sills stand the same kinds of flowers. In all the corner cupboards are the same collections of seashells and coral. On all the walls hang the same pictures. And it is a fixed old custom that all the inhabitants of the fishing village live the same life. Since Matson the pilot had grown old, he had conformed carefully to the conditions and customs. His house, his rooms, and his mode of living were like everybody else's. On the wall over the bed, old Matson had a picture of his mother. One night he dreamed that the portrait stepped down from its frame, placed itself in front of him, and said with a loud voice, "'You must marry, Matson. Old Matson then began to make clear to his mother that it was impossible. He was seventy years old. But his mother's portrait merely repeated with even greater emphasis, "'You must marry, Matson. Old Matson had great respect for his mother's portrait— it had been his adviser on many debatable occasions, and he had always done well by obeying it. But this time he did not quite understand its behavior. It seemed to him as if the picture was acting in opposition to its already acknowledged opinions. Although he was lying there and dreaming, he remembered distinctly and clearly what had happened the first time he wished to be married— just as he was dressing as a bridegroom, the nail gave way on which the picture hung, and it fell to the floor. He understood then that the portrait wished to warn him against the marriage, but he did not obey it. He soon found that the portrait had been right. His short married life was very unhappy. The second time he dressed as a bridegroom, the same thing happened. The portrait fell to the ground as before, and he did not dare again to disobey it. He ran away from bride and wedding, and traveled round the world several times before he dared come home again. And now the picture stepped down from the wall and commanded him to marry. 
However good and obedient he was, he allowed himself to think that it was making a fool of him. But his mother's portrait, which looked out with the grimmest face that sharp winds and salt sea foam could carve, stood solemnly as before and with a voice which had been exercised and strengthened for many years by offering fish in the town marketplace, it repeated, You must marry Matson. Old Matson then asked his mother's portrait to consider what kind of a community it was they lived in. All the hundred houses of the fishing village had pointed roofs and whitewashed walls. All the boats of the fishing village were of the same build and rig— no one there ever did anything unusual. His mother would have been the first to oppose such a marriage if she had been alive. His mother had held by habits and customs, and it was not the habit and custom of the fishing village for old men of seventy years to marry. His mother's picture stretched out her beringed hand and positively commanded him to obey. There had always been something excessively awe-inspiring in his mother when she came in her black silk dress with many flounces. The big shining gold brooch, the heavy rattling gold chain, had always frightened him. If she had worn her market clothes, in a striped headcloth and with an oilcloth apron, covered with fish scales and fish eyes, he would not have been quite so overawed by her. The end of it was that he promised— to get married. And then his mother's portrait crept up into the frame again. The next morning old Matson woke in great trouble. It never occurred to him to disobey his mother's portrait. It knew, of course, what was best for him. But he shuddered nevertheless at the time that was now coming. The same day he made an offer of marriage to the plainest daughter of the poorest fisherman, a little creature whose head was drawn down between her shoulders and who had a projecting under jaw. The parents said yes, and the day when he was to go to the town and publish the bans was appointed. The road from the fishing village to the town passes over windy marshes and swampy cow pastures. It is two miles long and there is a tradition that the inhabitants of the fishing village are so rich that they could pave it with shining silver coins. It would give the road a strange attraction. Glimmering like a fish's belly, it would wind with its white scales through clumps of sedge and pools filled with water-bugs and melancholy bullfrogs. The daisies and almond blossoms which adorn that forsaken ground would be mirrored in the shining silver coins— Thistles would stretch out protecting thorns over them, and the wind would find a ringing sounding board when it played on the thatched roof of the cow barns and on telephone wires. Perhaps old Matson would have found some comfort if he could have set his heavy sea boots on ringing silver, for it is certain that he for a time had to go that way oftener than he liked. He had not had clean papers. The bans could not be published. It came from his having run away from his bride the last time. Some time passed before the clergyman could write to the consistory about him and get permission for him to contract a new marriage. As long as this time of waiting lasted, old Matson came to the town every week. He sat by the door of the pastor's room and remained there in silent expectation— until all had spoken in turn. Then he rose and asked if the clergyman had anything for him. No, he had nothing. The pastor was amazed at the power that all-conquering love had acquired over that old man. There he sat, in a thick, knitted jersey, high sea boots and weather-beaten sou'wester with a sharp, clever face and long gray hair— and waited for permission to get married. The clergyman thought it strange that the old fisherman should have been seized by so eager a longing. "'You are in a hurry with this marriage, Matson,' said the clergyman. "'Oh, yes, it is best to get it done soon.' 
"'Could you not just as well give up the whole thing? "'You are no longer young, Matson. "'The clergyman must not be too surprised. "'He knew well enough that he was too old, "'but he was obliged to be married. "'There was no help for it. "'So he came again, week after week, for a half year, "'until at last the permission came. "'During all that time, old Matson was a persecuted man. "'Round the green drying place, where the brown fishnets were hung out, "'along the cemented walls by the harbor, "'at the fish-tables in the market, where cod and crabs were sold, "'and far out in the sound among the shoals of herring, "'raged a storm of wonder and laughter.' "'So he is going to be married, he, Matson, who ran away from his own wedding. "'Neither bride nor groom were spared. "'But the worst thing for him was that no one could laugh more at the whole thing than he himself. "'No one could find it more ridiculous. "'His mother's portrait was driving him mad.' It was the afternoon of the first time of asking. Old Matson, still pursued by talk and wonderings, went out on the long breakwater as far as the whitewashed lighthouse in order to be alone. He found his betrothed there. She sat and wept. He asked her whether she would have liked someone else better. She sat and pried little bits of mortar from the lighthouse wall and threw them into the water, answering nothing at first. "'Was there nobody you liked?' "'Oh, no, of course not.' "'It is very beautiful out by the lighthouse. The clear water of the sound laps about it. The low-lying shore— the little uniform houses of the fishing village and the distant town are all shining in wonderful beauty. Out of the soft mist that hovers on the western horizon, a fishing boat comes gliding now and again. Tacking boldly, it steers toward the harbor. The water roars gaily past its bow as it shoots in through the narrow harbor entrance. The sail drops silently at the same moment. The fishermen swing their hats in joyous greeting— and on the bottom of the boat lies the glittering spoil. A boat came into the harbor while old Matson stood out by the lighthouse. A young man sitting at the tiller lifted his hat and nodded to the girl. The old man saw that her eyes were shining. Well, he thought, have you fallen in love with the handsomest young fellow in the fishing village? Yes. You will never get him. You may just as well marry me as wait for him. He saw that he could not escape his mother's picture. If the girl had cared for anyone whom there was any possibility of getting, he would have had a good motive to be rid of the whole business. But now it was useless to set her free. A fortnight later was the wedding and a few days after came the big November gale. One of the boats of the fishing village was swept out into the sound. It had neither rudder nor masts, so that it was quite unmanageable. Old Matson and five others were on board, and they drifted about without food for two days. When they were rescued, they were in a state of exhaustion from hunger and cold— Everything in the boat was covered with ice, and their wet clothes were stiff. Old Matson was so chilled that he never was well again. He lay ill for two years. Then death came. Many thought that it was strange that his idea of marrying came just before the unlucky adventure, for the little woman he had got took good care of him. What would he have done if he had been alone when lying so helpless? The whole fishing village acknowledged that he had never done anything more sensible than marrying, and the little woman won great consideration for the tenderness with which she took care of her husband. She will have no trouble in marrying again, people said. 
Old Matson told his wife every day while he lay ill the story of the portrait. You must take it when I am dead, just as you must take everything of mine, he said. Do not speak of such things. And you must listen to my mother's portrait when the young men propose to you. Truly, there is no one in the whole fishing village who understands getting married better than that picture. This is Maggie Meg Reed for ListenToGenius.com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audiobooks. Permission is granted to download for personal use only, not for distribution or commercial use. The following is the short story, The Open Window, by Saki or H. H. Monroe. Narrated by Beth Richmond. My aunt will be down presently, Mr. Natel said a very self-possessed young lady of fifteen. In the meantime, you must try and put up with me. Frampton Natel endeavoured to say the correct something which should duly flatter the niece of the moment, without unduly discounting the aunt that was to come. Privately, he doubted more than ever whether these formal visits on a succession of total strangers would do much toward helping the nerve cure which he was supposed to be undergoing. I know how it will be, his sister had said when he was preparing to migrate to this rural retreat. You will bury yourself down there and not speak to a living soul, and your nerves will be worse than ever from moping. I shall just give you letters of introduction to all the people I know there. Some of them, as far as I can remember, were quite nice. Frampton wondered whether Mrs. Sappleton, the lady to whom he was presenting one of the letters of introduction, came into the nice division. "'Do you know many of the people round here?' asked the niece when she judged that they had had sufficient silent communion. "'Hardly a soul,' said Frampton. "'My sister was staying here at the rectory, you know, some four years ago, and she gave me letters of introduction to some of the people here.' He made the last statement in a tone of distinct regret. "'Then you know practically nothing about my aunt?' pursued the self-possessed young lady. "'Only her name and address,' admitted the caller. He was wondering whether Mrs. Sappleton was in the married or widowed state. An undefinable something about the room seemed to suggest masculine habitation. "'Her great tragedy happened just three years ago,' said the child. That would be since your sister's time. Her tragedy? asked Frampton. Somehow in this restful country spot tragedy seemed out of place. You may wonder why we keep that window wide open on an October afternoon, said the niece, indicating a large French window that opened onto a lawn. It is quite warm for the time of year, said Frampton. But has that window got anything to do with the tragedy? Out through that window, three years ago to a day, her husband and her two young brothers went off for their day's shooting. They never came back. In crossing the moor to their favorite snipe-shooting ground, they were all three engulfed in a treacherous piece of bog. It had been that dreadful wet summer, you know, and places that were safe in other years gave way suddenly without warning— their bodies were never recovered. That was the dreadful part of it. Here the child's voice lost its self-possessed note and became falteringly human. Poor aunt always thinks that they will come back some day, they and the little brown spaniel that was lost with them, and walk in at that window just as they used to do. That is why the window is kept open every evening till it is quite dusk. Poor dear aunt! She has often told me how they went out, her husband with his white waterproof coat over his arm, and Ronnie, her youngest brother, singing, Bertie, why do you bound? as he always did to tease her, because she said it got on her nerves. Do you know, sometimes on still, quiet evenings like this, I almost get a creepy feeling that they will all walk in through that window. She broke off with a little shudder, it was a relief to Frampton when the aunt bustled into the room with a whirl of apologies for being late in making her appearance. 
I hope Vera has been amusing you, she said. She has been very interesting, said Frampton. I hope you don't mind the open window, said Mrs. Sappleton briskly. My husband and brothers will be home directly from shooting, and they always come in this way. They've been out for snipe in the marshes today, so they'll make a fine mess over my poor carpets. So like you men folk, isn't it? She rattled on cheerfully about the shooting and the scarcity of birds and the prospects for duck in the winter. To Frampton, it was all purely horrible. He made a desperate but only partially successful effort to turn the talk onto a less ghastly topic. He was conscious that his hostess was giving him only a fragment of her attention, and her eyes were constantly straying past him to the open window and the lawn beyond. It was certainly an unfortunate coincidence that he should have paid his visit on this tragic anniversary. The doctors agree in ordering me complete rest, an absence of mental excitement, and avoidance of anything in the nature of violent physical exercise, announced Frampton, who labored under the tolerably widespread delusion that total strangers and chance acquaintances are hungry for the least detail of one's ailments and infirmities, their cause and cure. On the matter of diet, they are not so much in agreement, he continued. No, said Mrs. Sappleton in a voice which only replaced a yawn at the last moment. Then she suddenly brightened into alert attention, but not to what Frampton was saying. Here they are at last, she cried, just in time for tea, and don't they look as if they were muddy up to the eyes? Frampton shivered slightly and turned toward the niece with a look intended to convey sympathetic comprehension. The child was staring out through the open window with a dazed horror in her eyes. In a chill shock of nameless fear, Frampton swung round in his seat and looked in the same direction. In the deepening twilight, three figures were walking across the lawn towards the window. They all carried guns under their arms, and one of them was additionally burdened with a white coat hung over his shoulders. A tired brown spaniel kept close at their heels. Noiselessly they neared the house, and then a hoarse young voice chanted out of the dusk, I said, Bertie, why do you bound? Frampton grabbed wildly at his stick and hat. The hall door, the gravel drive, and the front gate were dimly noted stages in his headlong retreat. A cyclist coming along the road had to run into the hedge to avoid imminent collision. "'Here we are, my dear,' said the bearer of the white Macintosh, coming in through the window. "'Fairly muddy, but most of it's dry. Who was that who bolted out as we came up?' "'A most extraordinary man, a Mr. Nattel said Mrs. Sappleton, could only talk about his illnesses and dashed off without a word of goodbye or apology when you arrived. One would think he had seen a ghost. I expect it was the Spaniel, said the niece calmly. He told me he had a horror of dogs. He was once hunted into a cemetery somewhere on the banks of the Ganges by a pack of pariah dogs and had to spend the night in a newly dug grave, with the creatures snarling and grinning and foaming just above him, enough to make anyone lose their nerve. Romance at short notice was her speciality. This is Beth Richmond for ListenToGenius.com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audiobooks. Permission is granted to download for personal use only not for distribution or commercial use. The following is the short story, Poet and Scullery Maid, by Dorothy Canfield. Narrated by Victoria Gordon. Once upon a time, there was a little scullery maid, who, like all scullery maids, spent most of her time in a kitchen. It was the kitchen of a boarding house, and you can imagine what a disagreeable place it was, full of unpleasant smells and usually piled high with dirty dishes, which the scullery maid must wash. It was dark, it was greasy, the cook had a bad temper, and the chimney smoked. You would have thought the little scullery maid would have been glad to get out of it the instant her work was done, even though the only place to which she could go was one corner of an attic on the top floor. 
But oddly enough, she often left her attic room and slipped back down to the kitchen after everyone had gone. For much as she hated the kitchen, there was one thing about it she loved. It overhung a rippling little river, which ran down from the mountains above the city, and which was always talking to itself and to anyone else who would listen. All day long it talked, but then its voice was drowned in the rattle of pots and pans and the angry commands of the bad-tempered cook. The scullery maid sometimes went out on a little platform directly over the water, where she sat and peeled a mountain of potatoes. There she could hear the river much more plainly, and she was always deeply disappointed when the cook decided to have the potatoes boiled in their jackets. For on those days she had no opportunity to hear, even for a moment, the singing voice of the clear stream. But at night, that was the time. The kitchen was quiet then, and although the door to the platform was locked, she could put her head out of the window and see and hear the dear little river almost as if she were floating on its surface in a boat. She came to know every one of its moods, and how it looked, and how it sang in fair weather and in foul. Sometimes it was as merry as a child, and went along laughing and chuckling to itself till a smile came on the scullery maid's dirty face in answer. Sometimes, on dark nights, it whispered something mournful and yet so sweet that she felt her heart swell. On moonlight nights, it glided smoothly along like a moonbeam, with only a gentle lapping where it passed the pillars of the platform, and a low, happy murmur from the other bank. But under the stars, it was the best of all. Then it sang so gallant and heartening a song that the little scullery maid forgot how she hated the kitchen and the greasy dishes, forgot that she had no friends and no sweetheart. She only felt glad that she was alive and faced bravely a long future of bad-tempered cooks and unpleasant smells. Now, one of the people who lived in the boarding house was a poet, a really truly poet, although people did not know it yet, for he was only a young man and looked like any one else, except that he often forgot to shave himself. One evening he was invited out to a fashionable late supper. A great event with him, for he was very poor. When he dressed, he noticed that, as usual, he had not shaved for two or three days, so that a blond stubble bristled all over his cheeks and chin. It was too late to ring for anything, so he took his little pitcher and went downstairs to the kitchen to get some warm water. He had very old slippers on his feet, and they were so worn and soft that they made no noise as he walked. So that the little scullery maid, leaning out of the window, did not hear him any more than he saw her in the dark room. As he dipped his pitcher in the reservoir of water, he caught his sleeve on a pan, and it came crashing down on the stove. It was a question which was more startled, the girl or the poet. They stood and stared at each other in the dusk. He saw a very dirty little maid with a plain face and no figure at all, and she saw a very handsome young man, for it was so dark that she could not see that he needed to shave. Who in the world are you? Asked the poet. I am the scullery maid, she said. Good heavens! Do you have to stay in this awful place at night as well as by day? The poet was like other poets and could not bear to think of unpleasant things, although he was glad enough to be benefited by their results. No, I don't have to stay here. Why under the sun do you come back then? Now the scullery maid was very ignorant and simple-minded. You can imagine how much so from the fact that she could not think of anything to say but the truth. I come back to listen to the river, she said. The poet stared. Why do you do that? He asked. I do not know exactly why. I, I like it. There was a long silence, in which the poet heard the gallant song of the little river rushing past under the stars, hurrying along it knew not whither, but still happy and sure that its path was safe. Tears came into his eyes, and he set the pitcher of hot water down on the stove. He had a sudden realization of what the voice of the stream meant to the ugly little scullery maid.
After the manner of poets, he knew at once, much better than she did, what it said to her. He felt a whole poem chanting in his heart. You poor child, he said, and laid his hand on her shoulder. His voice was very soft. Nobody else had ever spoken to her so before. You poor child. I know why you like to hear it. And with that, he went upstairs and wrote the loveliest poem you can imagine, all about the little scullery maid and how she hated the kitchen and her ugly, unhappy life, and yet how sweetly the little river sang to her and told her to be brave. The tears were in his eyes many times as he wrote, and he forgot all about the supper to which he had been invited, for he was a real poet. The scullery maid stood still exactly where he had left her. For once she did not hear the voice of the river. She heard someone saying, You poor child, you poor child. It seemed to her she must have dreamed it, and yet there was the pot of hot water glimmering white in the dusk. There it was in the morning, too, although, of course, the water had grown cold. The poet sent the poem he had written in the night to a great editor, one who had refused every single thing the poet had written before. The editor was as bad-tempered as he was great, but he wiped his eyes after he had read the poem about the dirty little scullery maid and the song of the river, and sent for the poet at once to tell him to write more like it. This the poet was already doing. He had forgotten everything else and imagined that he, too, was a maid and lived in a greasy kitchen with only the sound of a river for comfort. For that is the way with a poet. If he gets interested in somebody's point of view, he steps in and pushes the owner out of the way and lives his life for a while. The scullery maid below stairs did not know that the blonde young man on the fourth floor was washing her dishes, peeling her potatoes, and dreading with her the harsh voice of the cook. But so he was. In the evening he stood beside her as she listened to the song of the river, and he stole her simple, ignorant thoughts one by one and carried away on the tip of his pen the love for the little stream which filled her heart. When he had taken them all and written them down so beautifully that he made himself cry many times, he put them all in a book. Then he forgot about them and fell to imagining he was someone else, for that is the way with a poet. But the editor did not forget, nor did anyone who read the poems. Everywhere in the city, people were moved to tears by the beauty of the river's song and the sadness of the little scullery maid. Gray-haired business folk, lovely ladies of society, unhappy young men and old women, all imagined while they read the poems that they too were scullery maids and that the river sang to them, and they faced whatever was unhappy or ugly in their own lives with more courage because of what it said. They did not say much in praise of the little book, but they dried their eyes when they had finished it and went to buy another copy to send to a friend. Most remarkable of all, they treated their own scullery maids with more kindness, which is a tremendous thing for a poem to have accomplished. The editor, who had recognized before anyone else how lovely the poems were, was surer than ever that he was a great man. Scullery maids were quite heroines, and even the ugly little one in the kitchen of the boarding house seemed so important that the grocer's boy tried to be her sweetheart. He was a good fellow and wished to be kind to her, but she would have none of him, because he was not blond and did not put his hand on her shoulder and say in a tender voice, You poor child. In other words, because he was not a poet. Whereas, if she had but known it, it was a lucky thing for her that he was not. She was so ignorant and neglected that she had never learned to read, and she was almost the only one in the city who did not have the joy of the poems about her river. She found out where the poet's room was, and whenever she could, she would slip away to try and catch a glimpse of him. But though he passed her several times on the stairs, he did not notice her. He was so busy living the life of an old, old woman, whom he had seen on the other side of town, that he could think of nothing else. 
Still, it was a joy to the scullery maid even to see him. And as she sat on the platform peeling potatoes, she thought how yellow his hair was and how blue his eyes, instead of listening to the river which had comforted her so long. And then one day, the poet got so much money from the sale of his little book that he decided to move away to a better boarding place. When the little scullery maid heard the news as she washed the dishes in the greasy kitchen, something snapped inside her head. And she could no longer hear any sound of the river at all. That day, as she sat peeling the potatoes, the little river flowed past silently, silently, and yet with so dizzying a gleam that, as she looked along and miserably at it, she lost her balance and fell into the water and was drowned. It was probably the best thing that could have happened to her. For when one can no longer hear any sound of brave song through the hateful noise of dreary toil, when one has lost one singing river, there is not much to live for, is there? She was carried down the current and cast ashore on the beach where the river runs into the sea. The poet, walking on the beach, saw her lying there and straight away fell to imagining the most romantic ideas about an unhappy love story. The tears came to his eyes, although that was nothing surprising for him. A beautiful poem sang in his heart, so that he forgot all about the poor little scullery maid lying dead at his feet. For that is the way with a poet. This is Victoria Gordon for ListenToGenius dot com. Thank you for listening. This audio program is copyrighted by Redwood Audio Books. Permission is granted to download for personal use only, not for distribution or commercial use.